This is a brief overview of the essentials of comparative politics, a great book by Patrick O'Neill. I will be talking about the first five chapters with the main points on every single one of these slides, and I'll be giving a brief explanation of my own on every single one of these main points. So let's get started. The first chapter is in the introduction. So what is comparative politics? Comparative politics is a study of domestic politics across countries, and politics alone can be defined as a struggle for power. We get into the comparative method. Comparative method is a way to compare cases and draw conclusions. We can do this through diff two different ways, inductive and deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning are the means by which we go from studying a case to generating hypotheses. Deductive reasoning is starting with the puzzle and from there generating some hypotheses about cause and effect. Then we get into major thinkers and philosophers. Um, I'll be focusing on three main ones. So first, Thomas Hobbes, he developed the notion of a social contract whereby, whereby uh, people surrender certain liberties of theirs in favor of order. Uh, we have John Locke. John Locke argued that private property is essential to individual freedom and prosperity. And in contrast, he advocated for a weak state. Finally, we have Karl Marx. Uh, he elaborated theory of economic development and inequality, and he predicted the eventual collapse of capitalism and democracy. Then we get into the qualitative method versus the quantitative method. The qualitative method was a mastery of a few cases through the study of history, language, and culture, whereas the quantitative method was a gathering of statistical data across many countries to look for correlations and test hypotheses about cause and effect. Then we get into political institutions. Uh, they're basically organizations of activity that are valued for their own sake, and we have two different types. We have formal and informal institutions. Formal institutions are based off officially sanctioned rules. Um, this can be like laws passed by the government. And informal institutions are unwritten on unofficial rules. So, like, this can be like um, uh, marrying at a young age in some different societies. Then we get into states with chapter two. So, what is a state? A state, a state is an organization that maintains a monopoly of violence over a territory. It must also have. Uh, it must also have and maintain political sovereignty. A state needs to be able to act as a primal authority over its people and defend its territory. Um, so what is the difference between a regime and a government? A regime includes the norms and rules of uh, regarding individual freedom and collective equality. Um, a government is the leadership in charge of running the state. A government is weakly institutionalized, whereas a regime is extremely institutionalized. When we get into legitimacy of a state, which is um, value whereby something or someone recognized um, and accepted as right and proper. Uh, so we have three different types, traditional, charismatic, and rational legal. Uh, traditional is built by habit and custom over time, stressing history. This can be like Queen Elizabeth II of uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, charismatic legitimacy is built on the force of ideas in the presence of the leader. This can be like Vladimir Lenin of Russia. And finally, we get into rational legal, um, which is built on the rules and procedures and the offices that create and enforce those rules, like President Donald Trump of the United States of America. And then we get into strong, weak, and failed states. A strong state is a um, is basically a state that is able to fulfill basic tasks and defend its territory. A weak state is the exact opposite. It cannot uh, fulfill basic tasks. It, um, it cannot defend its territory. And a failed state is like a weak state, except a state may become so weak and loose um, almost all of its control to a point where it breaks down and becomes a failed state. So just an example of this would be like Pakistan, and a strong state would be like Sweden. Um, high autonomy, high capacity is like a strong state, able to fulfill basic tasks. Low autonomy, low capacity, weak state, stays lacks of the ability to fulfill basic tasks, and it talks about territory, defending it, not defending it. Let's get into chapter 3, which talks about nations and society. So we have four main points let's focus on, national identity, nationalism, citizenship, and patriotism. So national identity is an institution that binds people together through common political aspirations. Nationalism is a pride in one's uh, people and a belief that they have their own sovereign political destiny. Um, citizenship can be defined as an individual's or group's relation to the state. Um, so like basically having citizenship, and then patriotism is a pride in one state. Um, and then we get to nation states. A nation state is a sovereign state encompassing one dominant nation, and a great, great example of this would be like Japan. Uh, then we get into political attitudes, which describe views regarding the necessary pace of change in the, in the balance between freedom and equality. And we have di four uh, different political attitudes. We have radicals, liberals, conservatives, and reactionaries. So basically, radicals believe in dramatic change of the economic order. Liberals favor evolutionary change. Conservatives question whether any significant um, change in existing institutions is even necessary. And reactions seek to, uh, reactionaries seek to restore political, social, and economic institutions. And then we get to different political ideologies. Um, I'll be focusing on three main ones. So first, liberalism. It favors a limited state role in society and economic activity. Communism emphasizes limited personal freedom and a, st and a strong state in order to achieve social equality and a s um, social democracy. Uh, it supports private property and markets, but believes that state has a strong role to play in regulating the economy and providing benefits to the public. Um, 
But that's it for chapter three. Let's get into chapter four, which talks about political economy. Political economy is a study of how politics and economics are related and how the relationship shapes the balance between freedom and equality. So there are different components. Uh, this includes markets, property, and public goods. Markets are the interactions between the forces of supply and demand. Property is the ownership of, um, of the goods and services exchanged through markets. This can refer to like land, uh, buildings, or even personal items. Um, public goods are goods provided or secured by the state that are available for society. Um, this means that no one private person or business um, or organization can own them. Uh, so then we're going to say inflation and deflation. Inflation is an increase in the overall prices in the economy when demand asserts supply. Deflation is when too many goods are chasing too little money. And dropping prices might sound like a good thing, but they can actually be devastating towards many businesses. And hyperinflation is inflation that is higher than 50% a month for more than two months in a row. And we get to regulations and trade. So regulations are rules or orders that are set uh, that set the boundaries of a given procedure. A monopoly is a market controlled by a single producer. Then we get into tariffs and quotas. Tariffs are taxes on imported goods, whereas on the other hand, quotas limit the quantity of a good coming into the country. Then we get to different measurements of wealth and equality and poverty. Uh, so we first start off with purchasing power parity, uh, which attempts to estimate the buying power of income in each country by comparing similar costs. And this can include like food or housing. Um, then we get into the Gini index, which is a mat mathematical formula that measures the amount of economic inequality in a society. So a complete equality is given a Gini ranking of zero and complete inequality is given a Gini ranking of 100. So one of the lowest uh, one of the lowest rankings on this chart is Sweden. It has a current ranking of 23. The United States sits um, at 45 currently. So it's kind of like half and half. So other methods of measuring wealth include through gross domestic product, which is GDP and the Human Development Index. Um, so let's just get into chapter 5, which talks about democratic regimes. So what is democracy? Democracy is ruled by the people. So there's represent representation in government, the elections are not rigged, the people are heard, a free market economy exists, there's also impeachment power. So there are two major categories of democracy, a liberal and illiberal democracy. A liberal uh, democracy has a free on um, has free and fair elections includes rights uh, liberal illiberal democracy is basically the exact opposite unfair elections no guaranteed rights so other categories include a direct and indirect so direct democracy the citizens of a state get to decide the government indirect there's a representative who is elected for you democratization what is it so democratization is the spread of democracies around the world and there are bicameral and unicameral systems so there's a bicameral system um, are legislators that contain two houses unicameral systems are legislators that contain only one house um, then we get into different systems parliamentary presidential and semi-presidential systems so parliamentary there's an indirectly elected prime minister who holds executive power as the head of government and then in presidential systems we have a directly elected president who holds a majority of executive power as a head of state and government and then we get into semi-presidential, which a directly elected president and a directly elected pre um, prime minister share the power in the system. And then we have electoral systems. We have a single member district where votes are cast for individuals. Um, and then a proportional representation or multi-member districts, the exact opposite of single member districts, votes are cast for parties. And in a mixed system, votes are cast for both, um, votes are cast both for parties and for individuals. So that's basically the five, the first five chapters of The Essentials of Comparative Politics, a great book by author Patrick O'Neill. And that's about it, guys. Thank you so much for watching.